welcome to both of you all and uh, friends today we are in for a very interesting conversation with us is uh, Simon and Leah and they both are from Pufa Antique and they will be talking to us some incredible stories of 19th and early 20th century antique jewelry so we're really looking forward to hearing all the exciting stories and of course your amazing antique jewelry that you have curated for all of us so let's hear from Simon Simon since you are the founder of Hooper Antique we would love to know what is Hooper Antique and also talk to our audience how do we know that the world of antique jewelry was a true calling so Hooper Antique Schmuck is actually an, an online shop for antique jewelry and what we're doing is um, the storytelling of antique jewels. So um, we are all art historians here, specialized in antique jewelry. And mm -hmm. what we love to do is a proper research on antique jewels and telling mm -hmm. us all the stories behind. And this can be quite interesting. So right. for us, some things are very important. For example, the language of flowers, which um, you can find sometimes in old jewels. So if you have a look at this, Tiara, yes. <laughs> which is an Art Nouveau piece uh, mm -hmm. made of natural pearls and diamonds, and it has the form of a mistletoe. Right. And you know what that means. A mistletoe is something you stand, stand under a mistletoe and then you get kissed. So <laughs> you can tell that this uh, tiara in form of a mistletoe is a love token. Okay. Made for a bride, made as a love gift, for example. Right. So this Beautiful. is one of the stories we, um, we think about here in what we are doing. Mm -hmm. And Leah, let's hear from you. How did you know the world of antique jewelry was a true calling? Well, I've always been uh, interested in stories. I, I love books and I've always been a reader. And to me, antique jewelry is very similar in that it, um, it's something that connects us to the past in a very intimate and immediate way because it's something that people wore on their bodies. It had right. a lot of personal meaning to them. Mm -hmm. And what I do now in my day-to-day -day work is I try to uncover the stories behind the jewel. So I try to think about um, uh, who would have owned a certain piece at what point in time uh, what is the significance of the materials that were used and uh, what would it have been worn for or at, right. on which occasion would it have been given as a gift? And the point well, is that every jewel is, yeah, it's a rare survivor of a specific mm -hmm. era and it is, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so to say a time capsule because it is preserved um, today and it's telling us something about the past and this is what we love to think about. And actually what we have to point out as art historians for our customers. Mm -hmm. So on that note, let's see some of your exclusive antique jewelry that you specially curated for us. Yeah, so Simon just started with the uh, mistletoe tiara, which yes. um, <laughs> may have been uh, <laughs> Born to the for a wedding. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> and um, I think that beautifully shows how, how the shape of a jewel can tell a story. But I yes. have something here, an aquamarine pendant, mm -hmm. which I think um, is a great example for how materials too can tell stories. And okay. that one needs a tiny bit of background because, you know, throughout the 19th century, aquamarine wasn't used very often and then suddenly at the beginning of the 20th century um, like this one which dates to around 1930 there is an explosion in uh, fine aquamarine evening jewels and I was thinking about why that is and of course there's always taste and availability but in this case there's something we wouldn't think about from today's perspective and that's the sudden availability of electric light and when we read okay. um, gemstone books of the early 20th century, it's actually interesting that almost every author points out the aquamarine is very brilliant in artificial light. You can see that. Okay. Yes. And um, other gemstones tend to appear washed out in artificial light. And 
that then was a revelation. And it's not something we would necessarily think about today when it's a Absolutely. Piece, because to us, yeah. electric light is a given. Absolutely. And uh, are you also wearing some aquamarine? I can see some blue yeah. tinge. I don't know. I'm not too sure. Yes. I'm actually wearing one of those rarer pieces from the 19th okay. century. This one mm -hmm. dates to around 1830. It's a, a demi wow. parure, a, a set of uh, necklace and earrings. Mm. And actually the time between 1820 and 30 was the time throughout the 19th century when aquamarine was popular. From all other decades, it's very rare to find aquamarine pieces. That's interesting. And how rare it is, you know, for Hufa Antique to find these exclusive and rare pieces? Well, it's, uh, so this is what I'm doing, actually. So right. I'm, I find the things. And I travel a lot, um, visit, I visit other dealers, I go to the markets and to the auctions. And yeah, I always have a look what is to buy and what is right. interesting enough for us to, to offer to our clients. And um, yeah, it is not so easy actually to find something which is authentic, which is good looking, which is good in quality. And yeah, it's... Um, what I do the main, in the main time. I think a good point also is that we try to mix it up in what we offer. We don't yes. only, we want to offer exclusive jewels, but we don't only want to offer museum pieces. We want to offer pieces that you can also wear daily. Right. So I think right. when you look at our website, you'll see there's a, a real mix of um, very rare, delicate pieces and ones um, that are just as beautiful, but that are suitable for everyday. On that note, let's see some of your beautiful pieces. Yes, so for example, here is something you won't wear every day, I think. It is okay. a necklace made of high carat gold. Okay. And if you have a closer look, you see that it contains stones. So simply carnelian, which is not a very precious stone, but the stones are right. carved. Yes. So, oh, they are carved, you said? Carved into little beetles, wow. which is an Egyptian motif. So you find this in ancient Egypt. It's, and mm -hmm. these are actually scarabs. And yes. this necklace is made end of the 19th century, um, which, mm -hmm. had, uh, which had, a, in this time, most people had a great interest in antiquity and mm -hmm. in... Um, the ancient Romans and the uh, ancient Egypt time and so on. And this is a particular interesting, particularly interesting piece because it is, it looks like a copy of an antique piece, but it is actually not. Because if you uh, find here the um, Canadians in scarab form, so which mm -hmm. is an Egypt motive, Mm -hmm. If you turn it around, you have them yes. wow. engraved, all in tell Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And you see Roman athletes. So, um, and it is a mixture of what uh, people end of the 19th century thought is antique. So you find um, here, for example, this little amphoras you find in, yes. uh, in uh, Etruscan times. So it is all a mixture and it is something um, which doesn't follow a specific style of antique jewelry. Um, it only gives an, gives an idea of what antiquity is. So, and it doesn't matter if the forms are Roman, Egyptian or what else. So it has an wow. ancient look, which was interesting for the people who, um, who have bought it in the end of the 19th century. And yeah. It, that's was, so interesting. Yeah, this is in this time you um, you have a you have a rise of, for example, uh, yeah, as well novels which right. um, in in Victorian England um, have a strong look to the past. So this is mm -hmm. what what people were Very thinking rare. about in, in this time, and yeah. So and I believe that everything must be handcrafted, right, Samuel? Everything huh? was handcrafted. 
Everything was handcrafted. Every single, every single bit. So the stones are cut by hand, and every yes. gold piece is as well crafted by hand. Yeah. What do you have for us? <laughs> I have another piece. I have this mango, which okay. was made in the U.S. in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about it is that the design itself is very modern. Um, yes. But the stones, the three central diamonds, the large ones, are old mm -hmm. minecart diamonds. So they were cut in the middle of the 19th century. And the reason why that was is because jewelry fashion changed so radically at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. that Lots of people had their old jewelry melted down, but reused the gemstones, uh, the other large and precious ones, especially uh, in modern pieces. And the interesting thing about that is that we find that even uh, advertised in jewelry catalogs of the time. So we have some 1910s and um, Art Deco catalogs, which advertise um, that if you want a certain piece in a modern style, you should send in your old jewelry and have the gemstones reused like in this. Yeah. Yeah, and this is what we're trying to point out. So that if you have a piece like this, you immediately, right. see, uh, immediately see it is beginning of the 20th century. But mm -hmm. then if you know how, for example, diamonds were cut in certain times, you see immediately that the stones are much older than the piece itself. Yes, and indeed. then the story is a different, a different one. So talking about story, Simon, my question to you is, why is the art of storytelling so important? So what I think is, um, first of all, important is what story is to tell. So what we mm -hmm. are doing is to have a proper research first, yes. to um, have a very close look to every jewel we deal with. Mm -hmm. and we sell, to um, study the techniques, to know exactly how it, is ma how it was made and, and which materials were used, because this is telling us so much about the time yes. in which it was right. created. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you, if you know what, what exactly you have, so other stones made before the piece was made or in the same time? Yes. Um, where does it come from? Um, yes. Is it hell marked? So what can you tell about the piece? Is what we are doing is to distill all the information okay. to, um, yeah, to something which, is, so, which, which presents all we know um, and all the results of our, of our research for our customers in a little text. This is to open the door. This mm -hmm. is actually, uh, we think that a piece of jewelry is much more interesting if you know something about it. It yes. can be how it is made, it can be how the stones came from, uh, mm -hmm. it can be who has owned it actually. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're doing is trying to um, put all these informations together wow. and um, yeah, and embed the, the piece of jewel in its own history and present it to our customers um, so that there is more connection yes. between a piece and a customer than only, okay, it is a two carat modern cut. Yes, diamond. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think this is much, much more interesting. And I think sometimes you just see what you know. And sometimes there has to be somebody who points out uh, right. an interesting detail or an interesting um, facet of the jewelry. And there are so many facets that, um, yeah, what we're doing is to find out which is the most interesting. Mm -hmm. So that means you all must be having a big library of, of books and of researches that you'll refer to, right? Yeah, for sure. Wow. And we also collect antique jewelry catalogs because it's really uh, important to precisely uh, dating a piece. And because in the mm -hmm. catalog, you can see certain styles were actually yes. not at the height of wow. fashion. They've already yes. been worn for 10 years, but they're still being sold. So that mm -hmm. gives you an idea of how long something was in fashion. And I'm sure that the whole research procedure must be so engrossing because, you know, one thing leads to the other thing. It's like, you know, being a detective 
the more you read and the more you research, the more you want to go into details, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it is always a, a journey in time, so to say. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So now let's see some journey in time and some jewelry that you have planned for us. So for instance, um, I, some of my favorite pieces are the late Victorian ones towards the end of the 19th century. Just like this necklace. Yes. Because what I like about it is the diamonds are set in silver, which I think yes. gives them a lot of character because at the time white gold was not yet uh, available and platinum was still very hard to work with. So yes. this necklace is made around 1880 and to set diamonds wow. in silver was the standard procedure in uh, Western Europe. Okay. And yeah. Leah, can we see the back side of the necklace also, please? The one that yeah, you showed sure. us? The interesting thing about it is that on the back, we have yes. a thin layer of gold because mm -hmm. if you have a silver necklace, uh, okay. then the silver may at one point stain your skin or your clothes. Yes. So yes. Uh, a backing of gold was applied um, to show the, uh, to protect uh, the wearers. Yes. Yeah. And what is, so to say you have in the 19th century diamond set in silver and this changed immediately. And this is what my favorite um, era of antique jewelry is. Um, it is actually the Art Deco period. Yes. And I brought this brooch here. Mm -hmm. And if you compare the two pieces, you see yes. Yes, the difference. Please. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So this brooch was made of platinum, yes. which was quite new to the jewelry industry in this times because you need so, such a high temperature to melt it mm -hmm. that, it was not, that it was not possible um, through the 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, so that the heights of uh, platinum jewelry are actually the 1920s. And this brooch was made um, by a jeweler called Köchert in Vienna. And Köchert is very famous because he made the stars for Empress Elizabeth, Sissy, okay. which mm -hmm. she has worn in, uh, in her hair. So there is a portrait, I think the most fam famous portrait of Elizabeth. Um, Interesting. And the same man executed this brooch. So made in Vienna around 1925, made set with the finest stones, finest diamonds and different cuts. That's so yeah, yes, please. Cuts. Oh, yes. Early brilliant. And can we also see the back side of that art deco, please? So here you don't have a layer of gold. So only the yes. finest pieces in this period um, mm. were made all in platinum. Um, much more often you find um, a front made of platinum, but the body of the, of the jewel is made in gold. This is totally okay. made in platinum. Completely in platinum, yes. Completely in platinum. Mm -hmm. And what a piece like this is telling you is this is the pure luxury. So yes. this <laughs> is only the best stones, the most precious metal in this time. So it was a few times more expensive than gold to have a piece forged in platinum. Yes. And um, yeah, it is just a play of shadow and light. And what I really love is the quality of the craftsmanship in those pieces. So I prepared another deco piece, a huge Colombian emerald. Yes. As well, set in platinum. Mm -hmm. And it is important to have a look at the backs as well. So yes. if you have a beautiful face here showing mm -hmm. the uh, emerald in a dress ring, which is quite interesting because in the 1920s, rings came in fashion which were not sentimental at all, which okay. um, in the 19th century, you very often have rings made as love tokens or as mourning rings. Um, with a sentimental meaning, and this totally changed in the 1920s. In this mm -hmm. time, rings were made because they are just beautiful. Um, if you turn it around, so mm -hmm. because of this, the rings are called dress rings because they are made to dress up. Yes. And if, if you turn it around, you see that even the back side mm -hmm. is beautifully crafted. So it is yes. hand sewn and engraved. And this is something only the wearer sees. Um, a very 
yeah, appreciated work, so to say, for the wearer. And this is what I, what I, what I really love is that this was made as a fashion accessoire, not for meaning. Um, and this is pure luxury for me. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, and uh, I've got actually some more pieces also from the 19th century. What I find interesting is um, that a lot of uh, Victorian jewelry um, would be called so-called novelty jewelry. So at okay. the time, you would have unusual motifs such as spiders, uh, swords, insects, mm -hmm. where. And um, <laughs> what I have here, for instance, uh, it's a dragonfly Ooh. brush. Beautiful, yes. Yeah, it was made in the 1890s. What mm. I find particularly beautiful is the choice to render the body of um, the dragonfly, this part here, yes. in mm -hmm. Australian opals. They were yes. new at the time to the European markets, these Australian mm -hmm. opals, and so they also pretended, presented somewhat of a novelty. Mm. And um, yeah, this would have certainly sparked a conversation if you would. It was supposed to be worn here at, the, at your bodice, at the dress, or you can actually also wear it as a pendant. It has two kinds of uh, mountings, one uh, with pendant loops and one with a pin. And this novelty jewelry was a fun but socially acceptable way to show your individuality. Yeah, which is, which is quite interesting, I think, is to use opals for a dragonfly. Yeah. Because they are color changing as the wings yes. of a dragonfly. Yeah, they are and yes. yeah. it, it gives wow. a naturalistic impression. Yeah. Yeah. And what I think is interesting in a piece like this mm -hmm. is that the whole the whole world comes together. So if you yes. have opals from Australia, rubies mm -hmm. from India, sapphires from Ceylon, yes. and from from South Africa, you have yes. all the world condensed okay. in one piece. And what you can think about, so what what makes it more beautiful more, than, yes. than it is, actually. Yeah. Yes. And for instance, this would have been another piece of novelty jewelry, mm -hmm. the little lizard, rendered in green dementoid garnets and diamonds. Mm -hmm. And because it was made with precious gemstones, it also would have been appropriate for evening wear. Yes, so absolutely. Course, there, there were also insect brooches. They were made of um, gold and... Um, yeah, they were set then with less precious gemstones, uh, less expensive ones, and would have been suitable for day wear, but these two would have been appropriate for evening wear as well. And mm -hmm. actually, yeah, we, we see um, how inventive people got in this time. And if, <laughs> if you have a closer look here, yes. um, the, the point of um, the amount of wheat garnet is that you can easily um, think that the green stones are emeralds, for example, Absolutely. or other green stones, and mm -hmm. these demantoid garnet were quite new to the time, so they were found in Russia, and till today, the most expensive variety of, of garnets is the green garnet, which is called demant demantoid, so... Yeah, because it's well. sparkles it's like a diamond, it has a yeah. very high uh, refraction, it's very sparkly. Yes. Very hard to find, so very hard. Very to happy find. found this little wow. lizard. Tell me, Simon, that does a treasure hunt also bring you to India? Since you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation that you know you're always traveling and sourcing these exclusive pieces, so has a treasure hunt also gotten you to India with some Indian antique jewelry that you have? So actually, as we are art historians, and this means yes. that we all studied here in Germany, in Italy, yes. so but in Europe, that yes. our focus is actually a European one because this is what, we, what, we, are, what we are properly trained in. Yes. Um, I think it's super, super interesting to have um, antique Indian jewels as well. So sometimes we have, so I mm -hmm. very often travel to England, for example, where, right. where I find quite a lot of antique Indian jewels. But um, what I really love is the quality of Indian gem of Indian gemstones. Yes. So yes. you see immediately that uh, a sapphire from India or a ruby from India is something mm -hmm. else. So mm -hmm. in in quality uh, meanings and 
Yeah, so what we love to do is to find out where a stone comes from. So which yes. is not so easy, but this makes Absolutely. it much more interesting if you know that, for, for example, here we have some um, moonstones from Ceylon. Beautiful. And only in yeah, Sri Lanka you can, you can find je, je, uh, moonstones in this quality. And this is can you please hold the piece back again? That's gorgeous. It's a brooch, is it? Yeah, it's it a brooch. Is. It's for the front of the ball gown, actually, of the evening. That looks so royal on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. And can we also see the back side of the brooch, please? Front and platinum, the back, back of the back needle, in actually in gold. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what I really like is that every part can move. So move, it's yes. Very articulated and. Very interesting. Yeah. You mm -hmm. have the moonstones in closed, closed set. Yes. Which is very nice to um, reflect the infalling light, which is reflected not only by the stone, but as well from the, from the backs of the settings. In case if our audience, you know, wants to learn or wants to know more about these beautiful stories that you're sharing, you know, is there a way that they can contact you or how would you advise for them to learn more? So, first of all, I think it's um, always a good idea to visit our online shop because okay. we um, always have our research results there and we very often reference books so if you find a piece which is interesting for you you very mm -hmm. often find a reference of a book we which like we that. which we are using for example we have one bible which is uh, in use every day understanding okay. jewelry yes of course <laughs> uh, yes. God, God, um, Harrison's which we used to compare our own pieces with the pieces in this book. And um, yeah, then we feature some of our jewels on Instagram, mm -hmm. um, where, which is uh, Leah's job actually. actually. So Leah is, tell, is telling on Instagram um, <laughs> sometimes yeah. other stories than you can find in our, yeah. uh, in our shop. I like to think about Instagram as um... Uh, page with uh, bite-sized pieces of jewelry history. Right. So mm -hmm. I always want to present something that's properly researched, but at the same time, I want it to be really accessible and fun. It should be entertaining as well. Yes, absolutely. And I must say that, Leah, you do a very fantastic job because everything is so well curated, your pictures, your write-up. And the, and the detailing and the story which you share on each and every post, it's so well researched and curated, really phenomenal. Thanks so much. <laughs> and do we have some more jewels that you would like to share? And also, you know, any particular favorite of yours? So what I really like um, is this necklace, which dates to the end of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And what I find quite poetic actually, is that it's a rose and it's set yes. with rose cut diamonds which uh, rose and set with rose cut diamonds interesting yeah. which beautiful. which i find a very beautiful choice uh, for this particular yeah. motif and mm -hmm. uh, they're set in silver and they're backed with foil so they reflect the light beautifully and um, it's a very different impression than you would get from modern diamonds because this cut um, is hundreds of years old and it was actually beautiful. made for candlelight so if you have oh, a candle dinner, <laughs> would be a great This is show. perfect. And can you also show us the back side of that necklace yeah. since you mentioned the back is open? So here you can see it's yes. also made of gold with the backing of gold. Yes. Because, yes. Uh, yeah, so it won't stain anything. And here as well, you can remove the central rose. So there is a little okay. screw. So you can unscrew it to wear it mm -hmm. as a hat pin, for example. So pieces of the end of the 19th century are um, sometimes very versatile, so yeah, which is not not only can be worn as a necklace, but as a brooch as well, or as a hat pin, or whatever you like to do. Yeah, this uh, is a good okay. example. You can wear it as a pendant on a okay. necklace, but it also has a brooch fitting, and so you can wear it whichever way you like. 
Because actually, the way we wear brushes today, which would be here, yes. um, just uh, that's a way that only emerged in the mid century. In the 19th century, you wore brooches centrally, so you would wear them here. Center, your, yes. Yeah, or you would wear them if you have a high collar, you would wear them here. Sure. So that's why they have different shapes than modern brooches. Modern brooches are often asymmetric, and uh, these ones are usually symmetric. And that makes yes. sense that you would wear a pendant and a brooch. Yes. Um, that it would have that function, that double function, because they would have been worn in the same place. And can we have more detailing about this brooch, please? But these are rose cut diamonds, and yeah, they're actually a flush set. So okay. they don't stick out, they don't have uh, any clothes that stick out. <clears throat> and uh, then there's a surround of um, rubies around the central rose cut diamond. And this piece is another example for what uh, Simon told us earlier about the infatuation with the past that we can find in, in the late 19th century, because you can find Baroque elements and Renaissance elements in this uh, particular piece. So what I think is interesting about this piece, so um, mm -hmm. I bought it in Cologne, and it's made in the Renaissance style. So it looks yes. like a 16th century piece, but it was made in wow. the end of the 19th century because after um, the union of Prussia, so the building of Germany, so to say, in the 1870s, um, brought the people to think about their own past. And the time of Dürer, the time of the Renaissance in Germany, was a time in which were... Um, very, very valuable pieces of art were created in Germany. And for this, in the end of the 19th century, people thought about the Renaissance time at the best time of German history to um, produce things in the style of the 16th century. Not only, in, not only in jewelry, even in architecture. So if you walk through German cities, which were not destroyed in the Second World War, you find uh, very many houses in the style of the Renaissance, so neo-Renaissance buildings because of this uh, particular era of history in Germany in the 16th century, which was highly loved in the end of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we can also see how fashion changed, of course, because yes. these pieces, the kind that I just showed, would have been perceived as old-fashioned and heavy in the beginning of the 20th century. So yes. what do you like to wear them instead? was something like this, very Beautiful. light, very yes. delicate. This dates to around 1910 and uh, made in platinum, which allows it to be very, very fine and uh, have these little knife wires. So it appears that it's almost like a, like a spider web or something. It's so ethereal. Yes. It's beautiful. And I believe that this piece must be very light. It, it is um, actually not super light, considering how light it looks, because the platinum is quite heavy. <laughs> the platinum is quite light. heavy. And what I really like is the combination of natural pearls from the Persian Gulf. Yes. Um, because well, we, are here, like... we are here in a time um, where cultured pearls were not in existence. So. Yes. So if you find a piece, for example, we have another one here, another necklace set with aquamarines and Brazilian topazes. And yes. here as well, you have natural pearls. And this is what I really love. So we just read the um, just That's a second, I'm, 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 I'm missing the word Stagebuch from this diary. Again. The, di <laughs> the, sorry, the diary of Queen Victoria, and Queen Victoria bought some pearls for her daughters, and she wrote, oh well, pearls are so expensive, I have to pay for a pearl more than for a like-sized like diamond. So in a particular time, in the mid to the end 19th century, a pearl was as, um, as costly as a diamond in the same size. Yes. And this is something um, today you can easily forget if you can buy uh, pearls from China very cheaply. 
Yes, uh, what does it mean to have a natural pearl? Yeah, like these ones. These are all natural yeah. pearls. And if Gorgeous. you look at the size of them, you must know that they yeah. were very, very pricey at the time. And yes. you have to open 35,000 oysters to find one yes. pearl. Leah, may I request you to hold the necklace once again? We would love to admire the detailing and the craftsmanship. Everything is handcrafted. I, can, I can't imagine the amount of hours the artist must have taken. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's interesting because a lot of them today, we often find pieces that have a lot of materials, a lot of gold, are very chunky, but not so much craftsmanship or work went into them because, yeah, that, that's, that's the difference. Uh, here, um, the, the hours of craftsmanship were not as expensive as, as the materials. Yes. So you often, especially in 19th century jewelry, you have pieces which are very light, use only very little gold, but are made yes. so painstakingly that it took hours yes. and hours to make. Of course. And everything was handcrafted. There was no machines. There was no sewing machines, say, for example, to like cut gemstones. Everything was handcrafted. Mm, not all, everything. There were also catalogs which sold um, factory-made pieces, of course, with the gemstones then handset. Um, but still, even then, the quality it was quite high for most pieces. Yeah. Although the pieces we deal with are usually handmade. But um, there were also um, pieces made from rolled gold, for instance, that catered to a market for um, yeah, jewelry that was not as expensive and also wearable for most everyone. And what like, is interesting about these pieces is that you can date them very precisely using the old catalogs. So it's always a pleasure to find a thing which is depicted in a, um, in a catalog dating to 1895 or something like that. Yes. And for this, um, the yeah, factory made pieces in this time, which are always nearly as good as the handcrafted or 100% or handcrafted pieces, yes. um, are for us a good source to date to date the items and to find out more. So where are they from? If you know where the factory was, you can uh, precisely no. say where the thing was, was made. But I have, for example, here um, a ring which I find interesting. It is a ring oh. with a topaz from Brazil. And as well, natural pearls, it is... Uh, made so in the beginning of the 19th century. And in this time, this imperial topaz, this is how it's called, and this is yes. a quite, a, quite a big stone for the time it was made in, mm -hmm. um, were highly in fashion. So for example, Napoleon brought, uh, bought some of these Brazilian topazes uh, as gifts for his wife. You can, uh, you can see them actually in Stockholm today. And, the uh, Swedish, um, they are part of the Swedish crown jewels today. And mm -hmm. here you have, have a stone from the same source. And this is what I think is quite interesting. Yes, and Leah, what do you have for us? So I have something which I liked very much, which was yes. the set, um, Leah. the Victorian set of a brooch and earrings. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about that is, um, this kind of set, uh, we call it a demi um, yes. so it, it consists always of a brooch and a pair of earrings. It would have been um, the go-to for a woman at the time, this was made in the 1850s, because if you look at, at portraits, um, a bourgeois woman would have worn this because it was representative. This type of set was not sentimental usually, it didn't have any um, inherent romantic meaning. It was meant to um, show off her wealth and that she was fashionable in keeping with the fashion of her time. And so the interesting thing is that rings are never part of this because rings were always sentimental. Yeah. And I can see a lot of detailing, right? We see a lot of texture, yeah. a lot of yeah. detailing. That's what I said, that, that the gold um, was expensive, but the craftsmanship was more affordable. Yeah, and what is interesting about pieces made in the mid 19th century is that, for example, this one is made of gold, but it's very, very thin. Yeah. So yes. it is quite big and quite chunky looking. Yes, yes. But using 
using not so, not so much gold, actually. So the gold weight is not important at all. Yeah, mm -hmm. which makes it really pleasant to wear. So these earrings are big, but you can wear them all day. The light, the way light. Yeah. And uh, can you help us? What gemstone do we see in the center? Yeah, um, this is uh, an almondine garnet. It's an Indian and... stone as well. So yes. this was not found in Europe. This was mm -hmm. uh, found in India. Some pearls yeah. around the yeah. There's a surround of seed pearls. Mm -hmm. And at the time, um, you could have a gemstone surrounded um, by diamonds or by pearls. It was quite yes. common. So uh, for daytime jewelry, it was usual to surround them with little split seed pearls. To so see, um, it's a closed setting behind the, yes. the garnet, and then it's backed with foil so that it shines very red and mm -hmm. very richly. Mm -hmm. Then the point mm -hmm. is that diamonds in the 19th century were only worn by married women. Mm -hmm. So if you okay. have here a set set with garnets and pearls, you could wear it as an uh, as an unmarried woman as well. So. Oh, interesting. I never knew earlier diamonds were only worn by the married woman, is yeah. it, in the 19th century? Yeah. No, we have a catalog dating to the 1910s from France, and in it, um, pieces like this are shown, and they are advertised as wedding gifts, because then it would be appropriate uh, for a woman to wear them. And of course, luckily, nowadays, we don't have all those strict rules anymore. <laughs> we can do with these yeah. pieces whatever we like, but still, <laughs> it's still very interesting, I think, to have all, that, all those backstories. Vikas has just joined in and he's asking uh -huh. any tiara. So yes, we did start our conversation with tiara. So Simon, if you quickly want to just show us the tiara which you showed us for Vikas since he's just joined sure, in the conversation. But I, pre I prepared a second one. Uh, so another one? Wow. I showed <laughs> this mistletoe tiara which is yes. the perfect love token for lovers because you have to be kissed under a mistletoe. <laughs> yeah, and then we have this one here as well which is Quite a big tiara. Yeah. Yes. Which I found in London. Mm -hmm. It dates to the 1890s and is a bit so more formal in style than, than the art tiara. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Set in silver. Okay. The back is totally made of gold. Mm -hmm. And is this also transferable? Can we wear it uh, in multiple ways? In this case, not, because okay. I think that the lady who has worn this was rich enough to have an own brooch <laughs> and earrings and she doesn't need to uh, have <laughs> two pieces in one, I think. Yeah. That's so stunning. Mm -hmm. A wonderful conversation. You've actually shown us such incredible jewels. Are these jewels available for sale or, you know, on your website? How can our interested audience reach out to you in case if they want to purchase any of these jewels? And with this, Simon, I have a question for you. What advice would you like to share to collectors who are looking to build a collection of antique jewelry? Yeah, so what I think is most important is to get a feeling for quality. Yes. I think it is the most important thing is for sure that you like the piece you buy. Mm -hmm. And then you um, have to look at the details. You have to get your hands on as much pieces as possible and mm -hmm. have a close look and develop a feeling for quality and for authenticity. Yes. So um, if you have a look on eBay, for example, you find so many aquamarines which are not in existence yes. because sometimes people think they have a blue stone and it must be an aquamarine because it is a clear blue stone. Right. And then um, grab a book, read about aquamarines um, and get a feeling for what could be an aquamarine. If it, even if you buy online. You can sometimes see if it is a synthetic spinel, uh, or... a topaz or, um, or an aquamarine. And then sometimes things can't be possible. So an art deco ring with a tanzanite can't be because tanzanites were only discovered in 1967. Wow. Uh, art Nouveau necklace made of white gold can't exist because the white gold was was invented in the 1910s and no one produced Art Nouveau um, pieces in this time. And this is something um, which you can easily learn. So if you know when, which 
gemstone was discovered the first time, mm -hmm. if you know which metal was in use in which time, and if you get a feeling for um, which era had um, with, in, in which era something was fashionable and not, you can easily yes. um, find out the mistakes dealers sometimes do and point it out. And I think for a collector, this is so important to get a feeling for quality and get a yes. feeling for authenticity. Yes. And this, yeah, I think we can help with that. If you read okay. the text that Leah is writing on Instagram and if you read the text on our um, website, website. Because mm -hmm. everything we sell is properly described and dated, yes. so you mm -hmm. always will find the date um, to the pieces. And I think this, yeah, is as well for education, nice just to to have a look and to have a regular look and to, yeah, um, just think about the items and get a feeling for it. Last question to you is, would you have any books of recommendation since you're the lady behind extensive research and a lot of writing that you do behind the content? So would you like to recommend any books to our audience, you know, which they could refer to? Mm, so yeah, of course, we always introduce the understanding jewelry to beginners. Yes. But then I think it really depends which area of antique jewelry you're interested in. And something that you may find interesting is that you can actually find a lot of old jewelry um, catalogs online and you can look at them, you can compare them and you can get a feeling for which jewels were actually sold in 1912, what was fashionable at the time. And I think that will help you greatly if you were trying to, um, to build a collection. Uh, use the yes. primary sources. Yeah, prim yeah that's what we, and as art historians, what we call primary sources. So not a book that someone in our time has written about old jewelry, yes. but the actual sources of the time. From the primary. Yeah. Yes. And somebody has just commented that they love your necklace. So do you want to show your necklace once again? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a um, piece dating to around 1830. And um, the aquamarines are actually of such good quality that they're set in open backs. They're not uh, foiled from the back side. Mm -hmm. They're so clear and so brilliant. And you can see also what I said earlier, they shine in, in artificial so light. So you very often have closed backs, yeah. which are foiled with colored foil. Mm -hmm. So um, in most of the aquamarine necklaces dating to this time, you have blue colored foils underneath so that the stein so that the stones appear much bluer right. much yes. more blue than they are actually and what right. nice what i think is nice here is that the stones are vibrant and the color is real right friends in case if you have any question you know we have very little time so please feel free and in case if you want to reach out to Leah or to Simon, then of course, they'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions and also to share as much knowledge as they can with all of us. Sure. So, Always yes. appreciated. <laughs> so with that, uh, thank you, Leah. And thank, thank you, you so Simon. Much. It's been wonderful. We never realized how time just flew by, but it was really amazing to see your wonderful kind exclusive jewelry that you curated for all of us. Thank, thank you, you so for much. Having us. Thank you. Thank you. Our pleasure. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Have a Bye. good evening.